Are you still echoing the statement, we are the leaders of tomorrow, and watch things continue to go wrong in your society, workplace, church, and the nation at large? It's time to erase that mediocre mindset, because you are the leader of today. Yes, there is a leader in you. God has gifted you with awesome potentials. Don't be like many people who never step into their position of leadership due to ignorance, fear, doubt, low self-esteem, discrimination, and insecurity. Your gifts and voice are needed now than ever. That every individual step into the position of leadership in different spheres of influence is why we have compiled different courses to suit your preference at Emerging Leadership Institute. We train leaders in corporate, nonprofit, business, and government from anywhere across the world. You have access to numerous online courses in leadership, personal development, human resources development, entrepreneurship development, corporate training, and lots more. You will be learning from world-class instructors to exceed your expectations. What are you still waiting for? Unlock your potential and transform the world positively with Ellie Africa. For further details, please visit our website www.eliafrica.org or call 0906-4419-269. Emerging Leadership Institute, transforming the landscape of the nations through impactful and relevant leadership education. Are you still echoing the statement, we are the leaders of tomorrow, and watch things continue to go wrong in your society, workplace, church, and the nation at large? It's time to erase that mediocre mindset, because you are the leader of today. Yes, there is a leader in you. God has gifted you with awesome potentials. Don't be like many people who never step into their position of leadership due to ignorance, fear, doubt, low self-esteem, discrimination, and insecurity. Your gifts and voice are needed now than ever. That every individual step into the position of leadership in different spheres of influence is why we have compiled different courses to suit your preference at Emerging Leadership Institute. We train leaders in corporate, nonprofit, business, and government from anywhere across the world. You have access to numerous online courses in leadership, personal development, human resources development, entrepreneurship development, corporate training, and lots more. You will be learning from world-class instructors to exceed your expectations. What are you still waiting for? Unlock your potential and transform the world positively with Ellie Africa. For further details, please visit our website www.eliafrica.org or call 0906-4419-269. Emerging Leadership Institute, transforming the landscape of the nations through impactful and relevant leadership education. Are you still echoing the statement, we are the leaders of tomorrow, and watch things continue to go wrong in your society, workplace, church, and the nation at large? It's time to erase that mediocre mindset, because you are the leader of today. Yes, there is a leader in you. God has gifted you with awesome potentials. Don't be like many people who never step into their position of leadership due to ignorance, fear, doubt, low self-esteem, discrimination, and insecurity. Your gifts and voice are needed now than ever. That every individual step into the position of leadership in different spheres of influence is why we have compiled different courses to suit your preference at Emerging Leadership Institute. We train leaders in corporate, nonprofit, business, and government from anywhere across the world. You have access to numerous online courses in leadership, personal development, human resources development, entrepreneurship development, corporate training, and lots more. You will be learning from world-class instructors to exceed your expectations. What are you still waiting for? Unlock your potential and transform the world positively with Ellie Africa. For further details, please visit our website www.eliafrica.org or call 0906-4419-269. Emerging Leadership Institute, transforming the landscape of the nations through impactful and relevant leadership education. Are you still echoing the statement, we are the leaders of tomorrow, and watch things continue to go wrong in your society, workplace, church, and the nation at large? It's time to erase that mediocre mindset, because you are the leader of today. Yes, there is a leader in you. 
God has gifted you with awesome potentials. Don't be like many people who never stepped into their position of leadership due to ignorance, fear, doubt, low self-esteem, discrimination, and insecurity. Your gifts and voice are needed now than ever. That every individual step into the position of leadership in different spheres of influence is why we have compiled different courses to suit your preference at Emerging Leadership Institute. We train leaders in corporate, nonprofit, business, and government from anywhere across the world. You have access to numerous online courses in leadership, personal development, human resources development, entrepreneurship development, corporate training, and lots more. You will be learning from world-class instructors to exceed your expectations. What are you still waiting for? Unlock your potential and transform the world positively with Ellie Africa. For further details, please visit our website www.eliafrica.org or call 0906-4419-269. Emerging Leadership Institute, transforming the landscape of the nations through impactful and relevant leadership education. Welcome Are everyone. Are you still echoing the statement? Thank you so much for joining us. Wherever you're joining us from in the world, we welcome you. Please put in the chat, let us know where you are joining us from. This is the Emerging Leadership Institute webinar. It is 4 p.m. on West African time right now. And it is 11 a.m. Eastern time. You may want to identify the time zone where you are. We celebrate you. We welcome you. We are here gathered to reflect, to learn, and to move forward about the great nation of Nigeria. This webinar has been put together again by the Emerging Leadership Institute. Emerging Leadership Institute is a leadership and training organization that focuses in personal development, human resources development, career development, workplace essentials, business entrepreneurship, and leadership development. And the aim of, of, of the Institute is to promote leadership education in Nigeria, right? Focusing on aiding character learning among young Nigerians. This is very, very critical because Nigeria by 2050 is going to be playing a very important role, right, in, in the world. It's going to be the UN projects that Nigeria is going to be the third largest population in the world. And so this is a timely conversation. This is a very timely gathering. And we thank you for being a part of this. We want you to call your friends. We want you to, you know, invite your neighbors. Let's put our heads together to have this wonderful conversation today. So without uh, much ado, we're going to get right to it. We have four speakers today that will be talking about reflecting on where we used to be as a nation, talking about what might have gone wrong and talking about, you know, the present conditions of the nation of Nigeria and also what we need to do about the future of Nigeria. We're very excited about our speakers, seasoned professionals in their different fields, people that really have a heart for Nigeria and wants to build other people, others that are coming up to really achieve the Nigeria that is promised, you know, such a beautiful nation that we have. And so at this point, we are going to be introducing our first speaker, who is Dr. James Fadell, and then he's going to be talking to us about the Nigeria of yesteryears, and we will reflect on that, we'll reflect on each conversation and each presentation. And then at the very end, there's going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions. So please, with each speaker, make sure you are reflecting, you are writing down your questions, and so that at the end, we can engage. And for the questions that we are not able to get to, we will provide the email. It's been provided at the beginning, but we'll give you opportunities throughout uh, to get inform our contact information so that you can reach out to the Emerging Leadership Institute with your questions. 
Again, you are welcome. If you're just joining us, this is the Emerging Leadership Institute webinar. We're excited that you are here and we're getting ready now to introduce our first speaker and go into the first lecture for today. Welcome. Pastor James O. Fadell is an Assistant General Overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God worldwide and a member of its Governing Council. He is also the Continental Overseer and Chairman of the Board of Regional Pastors of RCCG The Americas. Pastor Fadell first trained as a mechanical engineer and later obtained a master's degree in operations research from Wayne State University, Detroit, MI, in 1990. In addition, he earned an MBA from Lawrence Technological University, Southfield, MI, in 1993. His most recent academic degree is a Doctor of Ministry in Transformational Leadership from Big Graduate University, Seattle, WA. As an author and publisher, his books have been released by his own publishing company, Fidel Publishing Inc., to include Right Leadership, Your Forefathers and Your Kingdoms, Be an Encourager, Oasis of Elim, a 31-day devotional, 18 Destiny Helpers You Need, and others. He was mentored by the General Overseer of RCCG, Pastor E.A. Adeboye, who later commissioned Fadel for the work he is doing now. Under his leadership to date, RCCG The Americas has grown to 19 regions, 44 countries, and 1,190 parishes in three subcontinents, North, Central, and South America. Each year, thousands attend the annual convention at the campground in Floyd, Texas, of over 700 acres. Pastor Fadel also works tirelessly to develop other ministerial training programs to enable the ministers and workers of RCCG The Americas grow into maturity in their Christian work and service. By the grace of God, he is happily married to Pastor Manita, a medical doctor specialized in pediatric medicine, and they are blessed with three children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pastor James O. Fadell. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Depends on where you are located. All protocols observed. I greet the Eli group that organized this webinar and my colleagues, Dr. Samadeyemi, Brother Fela Durotoye, and Dr. Afre Tofade on this platform. You'll be hearing from them later by the grace of God. It is my pleasure to speak on Nigeria in the past, the good old days. And where did things go wrong? These topics make me feel like any time Nigeria is the subject of discussion, there are always questions to answer. And with increasing questions about the country than available answers can match, you will all agree with me that Nigeria has become a republic with many unanswered questions. L let's start from the beginning and let's start with the good old days as we know it. Number one, the family was very, very strong and there was strength in the family. In the good old days, one did everything with the family in mind. Failure was a taboo. It meant the family had failed. You go to school in the name of the family. One's identity is tied to the family. So people will ask, who, from what company do you come from? Who is your father? That is the strong family background. Divorce was a no-no. But abuse is frowned upon and not tolerated. When you are married, you're married for life. 
and stay in there to be a pillar of strength and support for your family. The good old days. Number two, there were strong ethics. There were do's and don'ts in society. Stealing was considered unconceivable. If you stole and you were caught, it brought shame to the family. We respected each other and each other's properties. Do you know then, the good old days, TV programs ended at midnight so that people can rest and sleep, not 24-hour programming. Farmers could leave their produce on the road. No need for anyone to man it. You bought what you needed and placed the money by the produce. Honesty was the dawn. Due to polygamy system, women in those families essentially became independent contractors. They started petty cash trades to care for themselves and their children. They do so to help their husbands when things were hard. The good old days. Number three, education. Education was taken seriously. You know, pardon my vernacular. As I sing this song, they sang to us when we were in the elementary school. It says, Batarea do ko ko ka. Batarea do ko ko ka. Bioba ka wire. Batarea do ko ko ka. Standard six education then was like a graduate today. Our edu was highly respected. Teachers were honored and respected. Students valued education. Our premier universities were world ranked. Ife, Ibadan, Unshuka, ABU, Lagos, and so on. Back then, if one graduated from the university, the whole village celebrated because the graduate automatically became the breadwinner for the family. Do you know, sir, as a son of a teacher, or my elder sister was a teacher, sons of teachers were expected to know everything. The good old days. Number four, self-awareness. Then you respected yourself. You handled yourself with dignity. Due to the British system, ranking matters. Social and economic status mattered. The good old days. Number five, exchange rate. The exchange rate then, in the early 80s, was one naira to one British pound sterling or one naira to one dollar. Our money was respected. Our money was valued. As such, we were able to go to UK for vacations and summer jobs. The British system went bankrupt due to the cost of war. And all now depended on American company to bail them out. The monetary policy devalued the currency. The good old days. Number six, order. Self-discipline and respect for authority were valued. Legal trouble of any kind was seen as a disaster to the family. It was to be avoided at all costs. The good old days. Number seven. Commerce and trade. Goods and services were in abundance in quality, in quantity, and variety. There was dynamic foreign and domestic trade allowing for regional specialty and healthy import and export exchanges. Do you know that product commercials were meaningful and trustworthy? Some of the advertisements we grew up with be important, be successful, use marketing, toothpaste, pimp. You remember those commercials, the good old days, Coca-Cola ads, and so on and so forth, the good old days. After reminiscing on these good old days, everybody had their own story. However, the question for us today is, where did things go wrong? Where did things go wrong? Ladies and gentlemen, you can therefore imagine my excitement to contribute few answers to some of the questions facing Nigeria. 
And since my topic ends with a question mark, where did things go wrong? Hopefully, my findings will help to reduce Nigerians' burden of unanswered questions. However, let me prepare your mind that I'm not a historian to spin a chronology of events and with dates and times into the logic of my argument. However, I believe my obstetrics and knowledge to unraveling where things went wrong will help clarify some of the mysteries. Obstetrics is a branch of medicine and surgery concerned with childbirth and the care of the woman giving birth. In this address, obstetrics refers to Nigeria's birth, nurture, and the growth of its present state. Having set the stage and the direction of my address, I would like to emphatically state that Nigeria was born from an act of rape. I repeat, Nigeria was born from an act of rape. Let me explain myself. In its simplest definition, rape is intercourse without consent, often committed with brutal force, with traumatizing threats. When the British colonialists invaded the people of the land, they raped the geographical entity to give birth to what they christened as Nigeria. The resulting newborn was destined to serve the colonialist political and economic interests and not those of the people of the land. Growing up and living with the stigma of rape, the colonialism. And do you know, sir, Nigeria has continued to make its over 62 years journey towards self-assertion unsteady. Its birth and growth defects owe their explanations to the pre-post-colonial eras that doctored its developmental process to serve the British agenda. Therefore, things went wrong when Nigeria failed to rethink and revolve itself from the colonization stigma. In the words of Albert Einstein, it says, learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. Nigeria should have learned from its colonial past, redesigned its today's life, and prepared a legacy of hope for its tomorrow. Let's throw about eight things that went wrong in chronological order. Number one, economic potential and prosperity. Nigeria's past was marked by prosperity, particularly during the oil boom in the 1970s. The nation enjoyed revenue from oil export, leading to rapid development in infrastructure, in education, and healthcare sectors. Number two, over-reliance on oil. For decades, the country has heavily relied on oil revenues, which in turn created a mono-economic structure, neglecting other sectors such as agriculture, and manufacturing. The tide started changing under the Buhari government with focus on non-oil sectors and exports. This has to be sustained in the long term, even as the world moves towards or away from oil towards renewable energy. Number three, what went wrong? Political stability or instability. Nigeria has faced various political challenges, including coups, military dictatorship, and civil wars. These unstable periods disrupted governance, hindered development, and eroded public trust, which has also created 
a culture of political instability and weakened institutions. The return of the civil rule in 1999 has helped political stability and smooth democratic transitions. But a lot more needs to be done. A lot more needs to be done. Number four now, what went wrong? Ethnic and religious divisions versus national unity. Over the past decades, from the north to the south, ethno-religious tensions have led to violence, political marginalization, and a sense of exclusion, which has hindered national unity and cooperative effort for the wholesome development. The 2023 elections brought such divisions to the fore. What went wrong? Number five, corruption, governance, and mismanagement. Since the days of military rule, corruption has been a persistently persistent problem in Nigeria with a widespread cases of embezzlement, bribery, and fraud. This has hindered economic growth, eroded public trust, and weakened public institutions. Mismanagement of resources, both natural and financial, has resulted in the squandering of opportunities for development and even opportunities for our children. Number six, what went wrong? Infrastructure development. Despite past economic growth, Nigeria has struggled with inadequate infrastructure development. Basic amenities such as electricity, transportation, water supply remain major, major challenges. Insufficient investment in infrastructure coupled with mismanagement and corruption has hindered economic diversification and limited opportunities for sustainable development. The Buhari government invested heavily in infrastructure development across rail, road, and other sectors. With more investments, Nigeria will reap the dividends from such and more in the coming years, God willing. Number seven, what went wrong? The dirt of local manufacturing herbs. For long, Nigeria has relied on imports for a wide range of products, including basic goods and industrial components. Do you know, sir, that some people have to order pizza from Lagos in London? What a travesty. The reliance on foreign manufacturers has stifled local production and resulted in a trade imbalance. Addressing this issue requires a multifaceted approach involving policy reforms, infrastructure development, access to finance, skills development, research and development, public and private partnership, and international cooperation. If effectively implemented, Nigeria can unlock its manufacturing potential create job opportunities for our youths. Last but not the least, number eight, education and skills gap. Also, human capital development. The education system in Nigeria, once reputed as one of the best in Africa, has suffered a decline over the years due to insufficient funding, inadequate facilities, and outdated curricula, which have contributed to a skills gap and limited opportunities for our youth. This has limited the country's pace with global advancement and opportunities for technological and economic progress, 
These and several other issues have to be acknowledged. They have to be addressed. And collaborative effort by both leaders and the citizenry will help chart a path towards a more prosperous and inclusive future for Nigeria and all Nigerians. In conclusion of my topic, to summarize my position and the point raised in my arguments, number one, things went wrong when our vision failed to transcend our struggle for independence. Number two, things went wrong when the vision for a great nation was poorly communicated from leadership to the followership in some federating regions. Number three, things went wrong when the federating unit decided to transform into a republic without harmonization of regional visions into a central vision for the country to work with. Number four, things went wrong when successive military regimes found their first assignment in obliterating the flakers of the original vision of the land. And number five, things went wrong when the policy formation of emerging political parties continuously failed to find their place under the umbrella of a singular vision for the country's greatness. These wrongs have many consequences, but none so eloquently proves the point as the continuous culture of political parties' interest over the national interest, ethnic, tribal, regional, and religious interests over national interests are adopted children of political ideologies behind party formation and affiliation. Yes, things went wrong when we lost the vision for the country we desired. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. James Fadell. Can you put your hands together in the chat on YouTube? That is a lot to think about. Dr. Fadell just spoke to us. If you're joining us anywhere in the world, we welcome you. He just spoke to us about Nigeria in the past, the good old days, where did things go wrong? And he broke down a whole lot of what has been happening in the nation. He talked about, you know, how division, how disunity and greed continues a, a, a cycle of dysfunction as a nation. There's so much that he talked about, our over-reliance on oil, the political instability, the inability of, of government to communicate with followership, of leadership to communicate with followership, the lack of understanding of the vision of who we want to be as a nation, right? And even the dearth of local manufacturing hubs. Um, I find that this is an area of opportunity for us as a nation, because Nigeria is so blessed with vast resources, but we've been so depleted in vision that there seems to be more of a desire to want what others want have, and we neglect what we have been given, the resources that we have been given. And so there's a whole lot to take in there. But one of the things I want us to be pondering upon is, what role can we play in harmonizing our beautiful nation? And what vision do we carry for Nigeria? What is the vision that we have? Is it a vision to be seen? It is, a, is it a vision to fill our own pockets? But is it a vision of greatness? It is a, is, it, it is, is it a vision to build up? So there's so much to think about. Thank you again, Dr. James Fadell for that really, really thought-provoking presentation on Nigeria. We have three more presentations coming up. And before we move on to the next 
uh, lecture, uh, which is going to be given by, give me one second. Um, the next lecture is going to actually be by uh, Dr. Sam Adeyemi. But before we proceed to that, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sheung Belo Olamushu. I'm an educator with a passion for Nigeria. And I have done research, actually. My expertise is in intercultural learning, but I have also done research on, you know, building academic success for African international students in particular, and really looking at the context of education, of the strengths that students bring, you know, from that educational setting in Africa and how they can take it to other parts of the world. And, you know, Nigerians, Africans are really, really emerging and being successful in different parts of the world. So part of what we want to talk about today is also just looking at how are we building the youth and what vision are we giving to them? So before we introduce Dr. Sam Adeyemi, at this time we're going to show an, a video introducing you to Emerging Leadership Institute what it's about, what the mission is, and how you can participate. Thank you. We are the leaders of tomorrow and watch things continue to go wrong in your society, workplace, church, and the nation at large. It's time to erase that mediocre mindset because you are the leader of today. Yes, there is a leader in you. God has gifted you with awesome potentials. Don't be like many people who never step into their position of leadership due to ignorance, fear, doubt, low self-esteem, discrimination, and insecurity. Your gifts and voice are needed now than ever. That every individual step into the position of leadership in different spheres of influence is why we have compiled different courses to suit your preference at Emerging Leadership Institute. We train leaders in corporate, nonprofit, business, and government from anywhere across the world. You have access to numerous online courses in leadership, personal development, human resources development, entrepreneurship development, corporate training, and lots more. You will be learning from world-class instructors to exceed your expectations. What are you still waiting for? Unlock your potential and transform the world positively with LE Africa. For further details, please visit our website www.leafrica.org or call 0906-4419-269. Emerging Leadership Institute, transforming the landscape of the nations through impactful and relevant leadership education. Thank you so much again for joining us. And at this time, we are going to take our second lecture. Our second lecture is going to be led by Dr. Sam Adeyemi. And Dr. Sam Adeyemi is going to be talking to us about what went wrong with Nigeria and really examining where we are. The Nigeria of our dream, right? And talking about leadership and how we can move forward as a nation. Please, let's in, get the intro for Dr. Sam Adeyemi and then he will start his lecture. Thank you. Dr. Sam Adeyemi has trained thousands of people in leadership for more than two decades. He has done this through the Daystar Leadership Academy which has graduated over 45,000 people since 2022 and through seminars, workshops, and conferences. He currently serves as a mentor to hundreds of CEOs. His new book is Dear Leader, Your Flagship Guide to Successful Leadership. As a global conference speaker, he has addressed audiences in many countries. In 2015 and 2017, he spoke at the Global Leadership Summit, a global conference attended by over hundreds of thousands of leaders in over a hundred countries. He holds a Master of Arts degree in Leadership Studies 
from the University of Exeter, UK, and a doctorate in strategic leadership from Regent University, Virginia, USA. He is a member of the International Leadership Association and the Forbes Coaches Council. Sam Adeyemi is the CEO of Sam Adeyemi GLC Inc., a leading global leadership consulting company with a mission to raise high impact leaders to shape the fortunes and destinies of nations. He is married to Nike Adeyemi, a global speaker and minister, and they are blessed with three children. Dr. Sam and Nike founded Daystar Christian Center, growing it from a small congregation to one that now reaches over millions of people around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Sam Adeyemi. Welcome everyone. Uh, to this webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shell, for the introduction. And I want to appreciate my fellow speakers today, Dr. James Podell, who did a fantastic job uh, laying the foundation for our discussion today, and Dr. Alfred Tofade and Mr. Fela Durotoe. This is the Imagine Leadership Institute. And I just want to say the greatest need of Nigeria and of our world right now is good leadership. So we actually can make do with every platform that helps us to cultivate our leadership qualities at this time. A former uh, Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Oliver Wendell Holmes, once said, what lies behind us and what lies ahead of us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. So I'm speaking on Nigeria today, leadership and the change process. Nigeria remains a country with massive potential for progress in spite of our challenges. I would just classify the things that Dr. Fadel brought to our attention as comprising of our strengths and weaknesses, our opportunities and threats. Our focus on our strengths and opportunities looking at where we are right now. Let me draw our attention to our population. Right now, the United Nations puts or uh, estimates Nigeria's population to be 223 million people. And they estimate that 60% of this population is under 25. This youth population is a phenomenal opportunity where many countries in developing economies are beginning to have a decline in their population. It's a major reason why they are attracting talents from different parts of the world through their immigration policies. We have the youths. Nigeria is bottom heavy. And uh, this is the population that actually is productive at a productive stage in their lives. I believe that this is a huge opportunity for us. Of course, uh, the question is, what do we do with this population? How do we unleash the potential of this population? There's a story that I often share in my speeches about a preacher who was trying to determine what to preach <laughs> you know, on a Sunday. He was trying to determine what to preach on a Sunday. And his son was disturbing him, just going in and out of his study. So he decided to give the son something to do to keep the young boy very busy. 
he tore out a page from a magazine, tore it into pieces. It had the picture of the world, <laughs> right? He tore it into pieces and told the young boy to go put the world back together. Believing that that would give him enough time to do what he wanted to do, prepare for his sermon. But then the young boy came, the young boy came back within a few minutes and he had the picture together and it was correct. <laughs> so the preacher screamed, how did you do it? The young boy said, well, while you held the paper up, before you tore it into pieces. What I saw at the back was the picture of a man. So I figured that if I could put that man back together, the whole world would also be together on the other side. And then the light bulb went off in the head of the dad and he just shouted, wow, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. You just gave me what I was looking for. <laughs> I was looking for what to preach tomorrow. So this, was the topic of his sermon. If you can put the man together, you can put the whole world together. The plain truth that is that our country will never be better than the quality of the people in it. So the big question again, what are we doing or what are we going to do with our huge population to unleash human potential? One other thing, I want us to look at is diversity, our diversity in terms of our opportunities. Yes, Dr. Fadel did mention the current challenges that we have with ethno-religious uh, divisions. They run really deep. Anyone who was a part of the last elections in Nigeria would admit that the ethnic divisions run really, really deep. If we can reduce the distrust, we will be amazed at the cultural richness of Nigeria and the huge potentials that it holds. First, the various perspectives that we can bring to our issue, the potential for creativity, if we would only allow ideas to flourish, and then the huge potential that we have with respect to tourism, because we have so much, we have so much to offer the world, so much for the world to come and see. You add that to our beautiful all year round weather and the potential is huge indeed. Agriculture, agriculture. Our climate and soil give us uh, the phenomenal potential to be the world's food basket. Almost 40% of Nigeria's huge landmass is arable. Of course, uh, crops, both food crops and cash crops used to be the mainstay of the Nigerian economy before the discovery of oil. We also have mineral resources. Our land is blessed. Uh, the last time the Ministry for Mines uh, did a tabulation of the mineral resources available in Nigeria, we found out each of the 36 states had at least two or three mineral resources. Some of the highest grades of them, in fact, in the world. Nigeria is blessed. And we could easily multiply our GDP in a short time if we got everything right. I would like to draw attention also to our politics. I would like to draw attention to our politics. We've had great challenges in this area and Dr. Fadel did point out some of them. First, he spoke about the obstetrics of Nigeria's birth. The fact that Nigeria was born as a result of political rape, we should say. We did not create Nigeria. Nigerians did not create Nigeria. Nigeria 
was created for purposes uh, that are not in the best interest of Nigerians. That having been the scenario, the big question right now is what do we want to do? I think we have the opportunity to recreate Nigeria. That's where we are right now, that we have this huge opportunity right now to decide what kind of a country we want Nigeria to be going into the future and what we want her place to be in the world. We need to have a national discussion. Now, it's one of the most urgent assignments that Nigeria has as a nation, that we need to have a discussion to agree on where Nigeria is going, agree on um, who we want to be and what our place would be in the world. Once the vision becomes clear, it's like when your destination is clear, the road that will take you there will be easy to decide. Once we decide on this collective vision that encapsulates and takes care of the aspirations of our diverse people groups, holds the potential to fulfill the aspirations of each group while still giving us the freedom to be different. It will be amazing how much we'll be able to unleash the potential that Nigeria has. We will, of course, have to define how to get there, the behaviors that will get us there. Um, and that's where the values will come in, our core values as a nation. And that will be addressed um, adequately by our next speaker. So, that brings me to the big question, the big question of leadership, leadership and the change process. What brought us here cannot get us there. Uh, in our political scenario, for example, we've had um, democratic uh, governments, we've had military governments, and it's, we're still where we are. So right now we actually need leadership to harness the phenomenal potential that we have. Where do we go from here? Leadership is critical to the management of the change process. Because what, what, what we all realize we need right now is change. Leadership is critical to the change process. In fact, leadership is the, sorry, the essence of leadership is the management of the change process itself. Leadership is taking people from here to there. How do we manage this process? Vision is critical. Vision, vision. Um, we've got to be able to paint a picture of a desirable future. And a leader has to be able to communicate that picture clearly. We've got to be able to sell the idea, for example, of a developed Nigeria. Because we ask ourselves right now, loads and loads of our young people, loads of people in the middle class are moving to the developed part of the world. What exactly is it do they want? Of course, it's the development in those economies and the environment that they create for the flourishing of human potential. Those countries did not draw from heaven, they were built. We can create a new Nigeria like that. So when leadership wants to manage the change process, the first thing is to define what we are changing to. Okay, define the vision. And the second thing is to communicate it adequately. Now, in my experience in leadership, people don't get vision only once. <laughs> they don't get it the first time. It is something we need to see and hear consistently over a long time, everywhere we turn. We need to have a clear, sharp vision of a developed Nigeria, and we need to communicate that vision 
to everyone in a way that they can understand and we can get their buy-in. Of course, we've got to create a plan. We've got to create a broad plan, create strategies for getting to the fulfillment of that vision. And then we have to execute as a nation. We need to execute as a nation and to check, you know, from time to time, our milestones, because we've got to have milestones. Uh, it will be exciting if at the end of each year, we get addresses from leadership at various levels, referring to that long range vision that we have. Now, this vision needs to transcend the four years, the four year cycle of our democratic governments. It's got to be a long range vision. And then every year we can check how far we have gone with respect to that vision, that long range vision. OK, so we need to have a plan. We need to execute and we need to evaluate. That's what leadership does while managing the change process. We evaluate how well we have done. And finally, we institutionalize the changes. We institutionalize the things that are working, tweak the ones that are not working as well as we expect. Let me recommend strongly here that uh, without having to go into the deep technicalities of leadership at a basic level, we need to reconsider our concept of leadership. Because when we say our leaders in our discussions, most people's minds just go straight to the people that lead in government or that hold high positions in government. And the discussion around leadership has gone way beyond that around the world. Right now, everybody understands that leadership is about the ability to influence one or more people and to use resources to achieve goals. Once we bring the, the definition of leadership or the concept down to that, then we realize that leadership happens at all levels. Now, this is what I'm driving at. In practically every scenario where you bring humans together, it is the aggregate leadership quotient of the group that actually determines the success of the group. I know usually we expect a miracle savior, you know, to come and change everything. Now in a democratic setting, that can really, really be difficult. That can be tough. It's teamwork. And they say a team or a chain is as strong as the weakest link. I'm drawing our attention as individuals to the point that each of us has a very unique role to play. You're cultivating your leadership potential is having great impact on the progress of Nigeria. Leadership happens at all levels. Leadership happens at all levels. I learned something some time ago because I'm a sports lover, especially soccer. And then a friend said to me, just pay attention to one thing. The team with the stronger bench strength is the one that will win. In other words, it's not even only the people playing on the field at the moment that determine the success of the team. The quality of those that are even sitting on the bench in reserve also could determine the success of the team. So the quality of the average Nigerian, the leadership capacity of the average Nigerian, at the end of the day, the leadership, the average leadership quotient of our citizens as a nation will to a large extent determine the extent of our success as a nation. So first I'd like to challenge us as individuals that it's time right now for us to realize We've got leadership quality and leadership responsibility at our own levels. Let's cultivate our leadership qualities. Three broad areas, character, competence, and capacity. 
I was asked a question recently. If you had to choose one between character and competence for a leader, which would you go for? Most people would say character. I said, I don't know if that's the correct answer. If somebody has character, it's a very good person. If he's to drive you somewhere, but nobody ever taught him how to drive, and he's had two or three accidents, broken a leg and a hand, I'm not sure if you want to stay in that vehicle. The competence also matters. On the other hand, if the person has competence but no character, I said you just have a sophisticated crook. So you need the character, you need the competence, and then you need the capacity so that we don't manage only small things, we can also manage the bigger dimensions. I would like to speak finally to those of us who occupy leadership positions already, that the best time to have prepared to lead well was yesterday. The next best time is right now. Whatever opportunities we have to read a book, to attend the course, uh, to have a mentor or a coach to improve our leadership skills, Let's take advantage of them. Let us all unleash our leadership potential now. Nigeria has phenomenal potential, and I pray that Nigeria will realize her potentials. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sam Adeyemi. Well, you heard it from him. That is his passion is leadership and he just spoke to us about Nigeria today, the journey so far, leadership and the change process. And he's charging each and every one of us that really the ball is in our court. There is no time to cast blame anymore. Each one of us must examine ourselves and take on our leadership responsibility. He said, so many things. But I think one thing I really want to emphasize is again, you know, the correlation between what he said and in, in reiterating some of the things we've heard about visioning. And, and first of all, before we even go forward, can we just celebrate Dr. Sam Adeyemi? I, I want to make sure we are doing that for each of our speakers, please, in the chat room. Make sure that you are clapping if you can on YouTube. And let's just thank God for really this visionary leaders that we have. And he talked to us about the importance of vision. That is, Nigeria, in a lot of ways, we've lost a sense of where we want to be and what we want to do. And that we need to define the vision. We must communicate the vision. Communicate it not just once, not twice, but adequately over and over and over again. Create strategies for these visions. Execute it as a nation. Again, casting that responsibility on each and every one of us, old, young, each and every one of us. And then evaluating and assessing. There's a lot of times when there is a vision, but if you are not evaluating if it's working or not, that is bound for failure. And so as a nation, we have to keep evaluating the vision. And lastly, inst institutionalizing those changes and making sure that they are taking root in a system. And it becomes a system that we work on. And then from time to time, we try those systems again to make sure that they are working. Oh, my. You know, this is really saying we have to take responsibility now. Right? The change process is us taking responsibility and keeping and keep and stop casting it on other people. What is my potential? Right? I want each and every one of us to write down this question. What is my potential as a leader? Because we are. We are all leaders and we all have capacity to influence change in our little environment, wherever we are. So I want you to write it down and say, what is my responsibility to contribute to the change process for Nigeria? This is good. This is good stuff. And please, if you have questions, you can write it down in YouTube. At the very end, we will take questions. 
We might not be able to get to every question, but we're going to collate those questions and we'll make sure that you get your answer. Thank you again, Dr. Sam Adeyemi. At this time, we are going to watch again the Eli promo video, just introducing us to what Emerging Leadership Institute is. The Emerging Leadership Institute as the Emerging Leadership Institute, pardon me, has put together this webinar. So again, we are going to just watch the promo video so that we know what this institute is about and we get an introduction. If you are just joining us again, we welcome you wherever you are joining us from all over the world. We thank you for availing us time and audience to talk about the great nation of Nigeria, a, a nation so blessed and with so much potentials. And what we are doing right now is examining the past, the present, and also what we need to take with us into the future to make Nigeria what it needs to be and what it has been called to be. And so at this time, we can watch that promo if it's available. Thank you very much. Are you still echoing the statement, we are the leaders of tomorrow and watch things continue to go wrong in your society, workplace, church, and the nation at large? It's time to erase that mediocre mindset because you are the leader of today. Yes, there is a leader in you. God has gifted you with awesome potentials. Don't be like many people who never step into their position of leadership due to ignorance, fear, doubt, low self-esteem, discrimination, and insecurity. Your gifts and voice are needed now than ever. That every individual step into the position of leadership in different spheres of influence is why we have compiled different courses to suit your preference at Emerging Leadership Institute. We train leaders in corporate, nonprofit, business, and government from anywhere across the world. You have access to numerous online courses in leadership, personal development, human resources development, entrepreneurship development, corporate training, and lots more. You will be learning from world-class instructors to exceed your expectations. What are you still waiting for? Unlock your potential and transform the world positively with LE Africa. For further details, please visit our website, www.leafrica.org, or call 0906 4419 269. Emerging Leadership Institute, transforming the landscape of the nations through impactful and relevant leadership education. So next is uh, another lecture from one of a visionary leaders in Nigeria. And the lecture topic that we have coming up next is by Mr. Fela Durotoye. And he's going to be talking on the Nigeria of our dream, leadership and national values. Now, I know from afar that this is a man that is very passionate and has really put done some work in looking for ways to change practical ways to change Nigeria for the better so now we are going to get to hear a little bit more about him before he starts his lecture please meet Mr. Fela Durotoye. Fela Durotoye is an executive coach leadership expert global speaker and nation builder he is the founder and CEO of the Gemstone Group, a leadership development institution comprising the Gemstone Leadership Institute, the Gemstone Leadership Network, and the Gemstone Nation Builders Foundation. Fela is highly regarded as one of Africa's leading executive coaches. He is an official member of the Forbes Coaches Council, an invitation-only community for senior-level executives in the global coaching industry. FD, as he is fondly called, is renowned for his unique style of blended mentoring and coaching to help business and impact leaders achieve exponential growth in their key success parameter. Through the course of his coaching and consulting career spanning over 27 years, Fela has developed and deployed his proprietary coaching framework, CASPA, to deliver clarity, alignment, strategy, planning, execution, and results to his clients who span across diverse sectors of the economy. As a leadership expert, 
Fela is currently on a mission to help 1 million people develop their leadership capacity and connect them with opportunities for exponential growth so they can achieve excellent results and outstanding success in their personal and professional lives as they positively impact communities, nations, continents, and the world at large. Fela Durotoye is a guest lecturer on leadership at the prestigious Stanford University SEED program designed to assist CEO of businesses with operations across the African continent to accomplish transformational growth. Fela Durotoye is an accomplished author who has several of his best-selling books published on Amazon. He graduated from Obafemi Awolowo University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science with Ignomis and later earned a Master's degree in Business Administration from the same institution. He is also an alumnus of the Kennedy School of Government Executive Education Program of the prestigious Harvard University. Fela has also attended the High Impact Leadership for a Better Society program at the prestigious Yale University. He is also a certified leadership coach of the John Maxwell team. He is happily married to Tara Fela Durutoye, a renowned beauty entrepreneur and chief executive officer of the House of Tara International. And together, they have three sons who think their dad is a superhero. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the founder and CEO of the James Stone Group, Fela Durotoye. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that you know, brief introduction, uh, my sister Shion. And good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's connected here tonight. Um, let me first of all congratulate the Emerging Leaders Leadership Institute on hosting such an, um, you know, an amazing or a timely uh, uh, conversation um, today. I think that clearly one of the things that I've always shared is that Nigeria doesn't need any one leader. Nigeria needs 220 million leaders, and um, you know we we we've got to be able to build a culture of raising leaders at every level. In fact, one of the things that I'm most committed to is raising a generation that is empowered, motivated, and stirred to operate with natural excellence. It's a generation of leaders who will have the capacity to be able to build not just themselves and, and, and role model for others, but build a nation that will have the ability to live to its fullest potential. And we know that Nigeria is a blessed country, but the question is, how do we transfer a blessed country into a great nation? And I just wanna say thank you so much to Reverend Dr. Sam Adeyemi, who, who extended the invitation to me, uh, and also to acknowledge and, and affirm um, the great work that uh, the past speakers before me would have Done. I'm sorry I wasn't able to listen in. I was coming from a, a family engagement and uh, just wanted to make it just in time. Um, so I, I acknowledge Dr. James Fidel and Dr. Alfred Tofade. Um, you know, I'm great to be in the midst of all the doctors, you know, in the house. So maybe for, I don't know whether the anointing will be able to rub off and who knows by this time next year, you might just find out that I also might be able to, to have that appellation. But I really want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you to, to you all for not only raising uh, leaders uh, and, and, and fostering the development of emerging leaders, but for showcasing and role modeling true leadership at the highest level. And I really want to say thank you. Um, as my sister Sean mentioned, I'm going to be speaking on um, the Nigeria of our dreams, leadership and values. And I think that the best way for me to do this in, in less than 20 minutes is to really tell you a story that I think would help us to understand how come we have gotten to where we are today. And then more importantly, to see what can we do as leaders and uh, what can we do as individuals. Um, in, and, and I would showcase some of the work that we have done as a way of encouraging um, anybody else to say, listen, if Fela can do it, so can I, where it is that we're at. 
Um, so a few a few years ago, uh, not too long ago, maybe about four or five years ago, uh, a young lady had come to meet me at an event where I was uh, the true leader, the true leader, sir, Dr. Dr. Suwade. Uh, a young lady had come to meet me at an event and she was literally crying. Um, I had just finished speaking and uh, and she just came and said, sir, please, I have to see you. Now, I, I do get a lot of the, I have to see you, or would you please mentor me or one of those kind of things. But but this time around, it, it, this, you know, the, the depth of her tears made me feel like there was something that was truly urgent about this and I had to make the time for her. And it turns out that when I did make the time for her, you know, I think it was the immediately the, the, for the following week, um, she came into my office and said, sir, I am a young Christian lady who is um, dating and is in courtship with a Christian man. And we have been dating for about three years and we have decided that we were going to get married. So, um, you know, we have we have held ourselves together not to make sure that, you know, there was nothing that happened between us. I am a virgin, she said. I have not lost my virginity to any man. I have always believed that this was the thing that I had to do. My mom used to say before she passed away, keep yourself for the man of your dreams. And I have upheld that. Um, unfortunately, her mom had passed away a little while before. To cut the very long story short, um, she started to get to meet the family much more often. And then one day, um, the soon-to-be mother-in-law uh, had asked that she, she should meet with her. And when she came to the house that particular day, the mother, the soon-to-be mother-in-law, in other words, the mother of her fiancé, asked if her fiancé could excuse them and that he should just go away. So she was thinking, okay, what's this about? Because of course the conversations have started, uh, her fiance had, had made his intentions, no. Um, and then the lady looked at her and said to her, um, and this was a Yoruba speaking you know, lady. So, she, And she said to her, uh, uh, <laughs> I know you, I have gone to find out about you. And the lady was like, okay, find out about me. And then she said to me, to her, you are a witch and I will not allow you to bewitch my son. Now, this is a Christian girl, born again, spirit filled, has never had any, I mean, raised properly. So for her to be accused of being a witch was something she could never have imagined in her wildest dreams was going to happen, especially not by a woman who was going to be her mother-in-law. So she said, mommy, I'm not a witch. She said, yes, you are a witch. Say that. She said, My son told me that in three years of dating you, you have never slept with him. So she said, Yes, ma. He said, hey, That's what I'm saying. You're a witch. She said, Mommy, I don't understand. She said, I know your type. I know your type. You are the kind of people that you will now you would have gone to useless yourselves, have abortions all over. Then when it's now time for you to get married, you say, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And then you now look for one man that will now take your, 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 this, your womb that cannot bear children. Let me tell you, the mother said, let me tell you for a fact, if you don't get pregnant, we will never marry you into this house. We don't want to come and bring any girl that will now come into the house and will now be buried. The girl was in shock. She said, I've told you and I've told my son, if he doesn't sleep with you and you get pregnant, we are not going to marry you because we don't know whether you'll be able to get pregnant in our house. So the girl came crying to me to say, well, God told me that this is my husband. God has spoken to him. But how is it that the mother is saying, if I don't get pregnant, we will not get married? The, the, the gentleman had never insinuated it. So she said to me, what do I do? <laughs> I'm sure you know that's an exam question. What do I do? My dad is not around. My mom is not around. FD, I've always looked up to you and your wife, and I just want you to guide me at this time. So I asked her, I said, what would Christ have done? And she said, well, 
he never did wrong. And so I know that I, I should never do anything wrong just because I'm trying to get married. And I said to her, let's start with understanding. If this is your husband, as God said, I said, two things are likely to happen. Number one is that God will change the mind of your mother-in-law. Or you guys will have to decide what you want to do with or without her. But if you choose to go and do the right thing, what if you don't after you have slept with him? Number one, she says you cannot marry. What would, what would happen to you? She said, I would be, I would be, I would die. I said, well, so understand. You cannot violate your own values and your oath. You cannot violate your oath to your mom in order to please somebody else's mom whose values are different from the values you were raised with. She said to me, thank you, FD. I said, don't worry. Walk away if you need to walk away. If he's your husband, they will come back and look for you. Well, before I tell you what the end, the complete end of the story is, let me just quickly say to you that this is basically what we're seeing in our nation today in different ways. It's a level of decadence that, that has happened where there was once a time when a generation knew what was right and what was wrong. And, and that generation would choose to do what was right. In fact, many times, most people would say to you that, you know, it was considered a, an insult to the family if the daughter had lost her virginity before they were able to marry her to the man of her dreams. It was a, at one time, the pride of a parent was that the, the daughter we are marrying, the girl we are bringing into our home is pure, they would say. But then something happened to our value system. And all of a sudden, the things that were considered wrong at one time, such as fornication, having sex before marriage, now soon became altered right. And I talk about the word altered right as though it, is, it means come together to form the word all right. And so it became all right for, for, a, for, the, for the girl to probably have sex and still, you know, it, at one time I remember that it was said that before you would even get married, the priest will ask of you, have you had any sexual relations? And you had to be able to say no for the church to marry you. And that was why you would wear a white gown, which was why they call it the white wedding. It was not the wedding of a white man. It was because the white gown signified a purity that came with virginity, chastity. And then after some time, the church started saying, it's all, it's all right if you don't want to wear white. Let's wear something that is, you know, whatever your color is. Because some of the people couldn't wear that white believing that they were in a situation. In fact, there was a story that a gentleman once told me when he heard about me talking about what was right and what was wrong. He said, fella, you can't believe that it, when we asked the girl, she proudly said, yes, she and her, her, her fiancé were very sexually active. And then we said we couldn't marry them. It was the father of the bride that came as a deacon in our church to say, why would you not be able to marry my daughter? Why? Is she pregnant? So the, the, the bar had shifted was from is she a virgin to is she pregnant? And then there was another time where another father came and said, I am a significant, my, yes, my daughter is pregnant, but did she kill somebody? Did she kill anybody? Is it not pregnancy? That's what we are hoping for. So now you see a situation where the values have changed from what was right at one point in time to what was all right at another point in time, to the point where now it's not even about whether they're justifying what is right, is to say that they are vilifying what is right. And that is what happens in a society or a nation where the values have decayed to the point of decadence. The question is, how do you fix it? To fix any problem, usually you have to ask who's responsible for solving the problem. I don't need to ask who is responsible for the problem because that is looking in the direction of blame. One of the things I have realized is that leadership, it, blaming is not a leadership skill because leadership is about solving problems. The challenge is when we ask 
ourselves, how do we look to our leaders? Then we begin to look at the people who are supposed to be those who are our leaders, and then we find a crisis in that space. That those who are, are supposed to be in, in positions of authority and the positions of, 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 of privilege to be able to guide a generation have been the ones that have completely confused that generation. And so you ask yourself, what does this mean? What do we do? Now, to think of it as, well, leaders, and you almost want to say, they'll look at the president and look at the governors and look at the people in power. I came to realize the difference between leadership and rulership. That, you know, apparently for many years, we have been calling our leaders or our rulers leaders and thinking that we, their subjects, were followers. In fact, what, what had happened was that about 13 years ago, I, 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 I was watching the news sometime in the month of May. I think it was on the 5th of May. And at that time, the, there was the, the campaign of you know, going on. It was David Cameron and Gordon Brown who were tussling for the leadership of the, 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 the British government. And, you know, I remember watching Sky News, constantly checking what's going on. And they were talking about David Cameron, the leader of the Conservative Party, and Gordon Brown, the leader of the Labour Party. And they were talking about who was going to be the next leader of the United Kingdom. And all of a sudden, on that particular day, they, were, they went on a break. And when they came back, there was a breaking news. And the lady said, we've just received, you know, credible information from Reuters that the ruler of Nigeria, President Umaru Musa Yaradua is dead. And it is expected that the, the, de the vice president, Dr. Ebele Goodluck Jonathan, will be the next ruler of Nigeria. And I was in shock. I thought to myself, what? How dare you? I was shouting at the television. I knew she couldn't hear me. But I was shouting, how dare you? How dare you call your own leaders? And then it is our own, you are calling rulers. How dare you? And then I heard in my spirit, my friend, calm down. And he, and I heard the Holy Spirit ask me, what does the party, he said, which party is in government? And at that time I said, the People's Democratic Party. He says, and what do the People's Democratic government, uh, Party describe themselves as, I said, the ruling party. And it says everything creates according to its own kind. So a ruling party must produce, and I did like this, rulers. And for a moment, I believe the Holy Spirit started to say to me, but you know, it didn't start today, fella. We've gone back centuries to a time when we had traditional rulers, which was never the will of God. Because in the will of God, in the perfect will of God, when God created man and gave him the rulership mandate, the dominion mandate, it was over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle of the field, it was over the, the land and everything that creeps on it. Man was never supposed to be under the rulership of man. And so if man was to have dominion, but not rule over man. What was man meant to do? Man was meant to lead, was meant to father. I mean, I always think about the fact that there is a reason why of all the kind of ways God could use to demonstrate his, his relationship with mankind, he will call himself father. You see, God didn't create the idea of traditional rulers. God wanted royal fathers. And traditional rulers, as you know, are the ones who say, no, you cannot be greater than me. You must be subject to me. They measure their success by subjects. Royal fathers are the ones who aspire for the next generation to be better than them, to be greater than them. The pride of a father is in the greatness of their sons. But rather than have royal fathers, we had traditional rulers. And the traditional rulership went for many centuries until there was a disruption by the colonial rulers and masters who didn't come to lead. They came to conquer and take our resources. So they came to rule and subdue and subject. And then the colonial rule went on for a while. Then we had a brief stint of leadership. 
that came out about the time when there was a move, a pan-African move for the independence of countries across Africa. Kwame Nkrumah, Jul Jul Jumo Kenyatta, Julius Nyerere, uh, the, you know, Kamu Zubanda, I can go on and on, Obafemi Awolo War. These guys were leaders. They didn't have any power, they didn't have any money, they didn't have anything, but they had decided in their hearts that even though we were born into uh, as second class citizens into our own, our own countries and our parents didn't fight them, we will not give subjugation to the next generation. Cut the long story short, rulers came back as military rulers. And then we had democratic rulers who then emerged. And so out of the 24 years of Nigeria's uh, 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 fourth republic democracy, 16 out of those 24 years have been ruled by past military rulers and ruling parties. So we realize that, okay, we cannot necessarily look to the rulership to provide leadership. Where then must leadership come from? Well, to cut the long story short, I want you to watch a video that it's just about two minutes, and then I would quickly dimension that video and talk about something else, and then we'll close for today, if you don't mind. Can we watch that video shortly? सर आपके लिए उस पार कार का इंतजाम किया है सर आइए सर ये चल चल watched that video a few years ago and it completely changed my com my life in terms of just understanding of the difference between positional leadership and true leadership it's actually called truly the best ever video if you want to check it out on youtube and i've used that video many times to be able to highlight the distinction between rulership and leadership first of all talking about what leadership is not clearly everybody agrees that usually it, that that it's that little boy that that was the leader of the day but if that little boy was the leader of the day, then clearly leadership is not about position. It's not about age. It's not about status. It's not about employment. It's not about you know, election. Leadership is not about those things. You, you cannot rule without a position. You cannot rule without authority. You cannot rule without the legitimacy of, of the authority that you need to rule. But you can lead without any of those things. Why? Because leadership is about influence. And therefore, everyone can lead. Because leadership is about taking a step forward to solve a problem, to make things better, make people better, make places better. 
Leadership is the ability to be able to galvanize people, whether through words or action, to be able to focus on a common cause that eventually makes life better for everyone, not just the leader. But most importantly, I think leadership is the ability to bring out the best in oneself and in others. And to be that, you have to be able to role model certain values that do not make other people who look up to you have to copy you or become copies of you, but that a real leader is someone who, if anyone were to imitate you, they become a better version of themselves. Why? Because the values of a leader become the culture of the body. Leaders, by the kind of influence that they have, especially role model leaders, are the ones who must be able to showcase the kind of behavior that causes everybody else, if they were to behave that way, to become the best version of themselves, to thrive, to grow, to be able to do great things. This is the real work of leadership. And leadership understands that values are the things, that they, what I call the, the operating system. In the, in the body, the, 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 your PVC, and I'm not talking about, about, about you know, uh, uh, your permanent voter's card, your personal value code is the thing that helps you to decide what is wrong and what is right, what is good and what is bad, what is acceptable, what is not. It's what helps you to take decisions when options and choices are, are in front of you. In fact, the truth be told, if you don't value your values, then you will fall for anything. Somebody once said, the price of a man is the point at which you will take what was wrong and call it right. What you said no to, you would say, okay, that's the price of a man. And when your values are completely sacred to you, then nobody can get you to do even at the cost of the loss of a marriage proposal. To cut the long story short, so that we wrap up that story, that girl told her, her fiance, I will not marry you. I will not break my vows. And then it turned out that they started to pray together. Before we knew it, all of a sudden, the mother, the, so the mother of the, of the boy called and, and, and one day came and, and she started crying and said she became born again and she became saved and she realized that what she had asked of her son and his and and he, the, his his fiance was absolutely wrong. She called the girl, asked for forgiveness, and they got married. And she went everywhere boasting about how her daughter was such a principled girl that she would never give in to doing anything that was wrong. The girl became the apple of this her mother-in-law's eye. What if she had fallen for it? What if her values were not strong enough? So what do we need to do? Well, what we need to do is the following. I'm just wrapping this up very quickly. The, what we need to do is the following. Number one, we need to find a, a people who would accept responsibility to, to not only identify the values that we should lead by to build a great nation, but more importantly, to be able to translate those values into language that everybody can understand, statements that everybody can understand. And then be able to translate that into the languages and tribes uh, that is acceptable to everybody. In other words, the values of a nation must be acceptable to every tribe, must be acceptable to every gender, must be acceptable to the young and the old, to the rich and the poor. The values that will hold a nation there must be able to be something that everybody wants their siblings, their, their employees, their neighbors, their spouses to be. It must transcend religion. The question is, who are the people that are meant to be the custodians of this? Well, we know one thing for sure. Families are one of the first places that people are supposed to learn about values. But we know that that itself has almost been a, a, a faulty pillar. With the emergence of the professional uh, parents who literally have not been able to sometimes come home before 12 uh, or 11 min midnight uh, because of traffic, it's working six days a week. But if it's not the family, where else could values have been learned? Schools, educational institutions. But then we've seen that, you know, with the emergence of pay for marks, sex for marks, and all of those things, lecturers themselves and teachers cannot be, cannot be trusted fully as the ones that will have to, to role model values. So where else do we go? 
Well, so if it's not the, the family, it's not the school, well, maybe the corporate organizations, when you do get out, how do you now get into an organization that shapes your values and begins to add? But then, then of course, sometimes we found out that it is the organization that first taught you the how to be able to give bribe so that we can get the contract. And then we find out if it's not the, the family, if it's not the, 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 it's the school education, if it's not the corporate organization, where do we go? Well, government is supposed to be able to share what values are. In fact, they are probably the ones that should most importantly do that. But so if it's not the, 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 the government, where? Well, another place is the society, the neighborhood. Growing up, many people would say that you are more scared of your neighbors than probably of your own parents. If you did the wrong thing, your neighbor could smack you right there and then. Today, we are no man's children. So where else can we go? Well, the last bastion of hope, the, the church or the religious institutions. And I would say that I believe that by the grace of God, that's what has helped this nation so far. It's not to say that the church itself has not had people who have not necessarily modeled uh, uh, the wrong values, but we have a document that has at least and a role model within our, our, our religious institutions um, that typically have been the epitome of good values. So how do we get all of these pillars to begin to find a way to agree the family, the, the educational institutions, um, government, corporate bodies, um, the church, you know, how do we get them to begin to agree? Who's going to do the work? We know we have a national orientation agency, but can we wait? Can we wait? I think the answer is not. So one day I asked myself, Fela, the challenge that I saw the boy step up to was the challenge of the tree that was affecting everybody else's life. Fela, what is your own tree? And it occurred to me that one of the trees that I had to push was the tree of the values decadence. So where do we start from? So then we have to define the values that we want. We have to define those values within a value system and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a state those values very clearly in a way that people could have. And so I, I realized that, and if I can just show you very quickly, we came up with 10 values that we call the personal value code that are embedded in the personal creed. And we said, if you're gonna build a great nation, the kind of nation people want to live in, want to work in, want to do business in, and want to raise the next generation. And that's really what the nation of our dreams are. In the, in, you know, towards the 2019 uh, presidential elections, I was involved in running a presidential campaign. I went all across Nigeria. I found out everybody wants the same thing. They want a nation that works. They want a nation where, where there are opportunities for everybody. And what is acceptable to the rich is accessible to the poor. They wanted a, a nation where the son of a nobody can become somebody without knowing anybody. That's what they wanted. They wanted a Nigeria that works for everybody. That's the Nigeria of our dreams. And to be able to have a Nigeria that is a most desirable nation to live in, you must have Nigerians that are the most desirable people to live in, with. To have a Nigeria that is the most desirable nation to do business in, you must have the most desirable people to do business with. To have a Nigeria that is the most desirable nation to work in, you must have the most desirable people to work with. To have a Nigeria that is the most desirable nation to raise the next generation in, you must be able to have the most desirable parents for the next generation. And what values do we have? Can we come up with? And we came up with 10 values or 10 value statements, which are make a positive impact on everyone you meet and everywhere you go. Be a solution provider, not a part of the problem to be solved. Be a role model worthy of emulation. Be your best in all you do, particularly what you're naturally good at. Do the right thing at all times, regardless of who is doing the wrong thing. Value time and make the best use of it. Care and show respect to all through your words and your actions. Consciously build a great legacy starting now, today, and every day. Live a life of integrity and honor and make your family, your nation, and your God proud. And these 10 values are things that we now put in a value card. Let me see if I have one here. Oh, sorry, I don't have one here. We put it in a value card and we have given over 420,000 of those cards away. 
we segmented the society and said, okay, how do we take values to this to, to that society? And we decided that we we're going to go to primary schools and secondary schools and universities. And in over 300 primary schools and secondary schools in Nigeria, in, in Nigeria, including in Lagos, we had these children stating and reciting these values every Monday. On Monday, when they get into their classroom, they, they recite the first two values. On Tuesday, they recite the second two. The, on Wednesday, they recite the third. And that's how they've gone. They also have values clubs where they take a value for the week and then think of how to use, um, you know, art, art, drama, poetry, or music to be able to reinforce those values in children. We started to hear stories of how children were doing better in school because they were, they were paying more attention. They were coming to school on time. Um, parents were beginning to say, what are you training our children? What are you telling them? I mean, we were almost late and the child was crying. I don't want to be late. I value time and make the best use of it. I don't want to be late. You had children telling each other instead of fighting each other and saying, is that how to make a positive impact on, every, on somebody? And teachers started to use those values to guide their, their children. We started to see parents adopting the values and reciting it in their own homes because the schools that we encouraged, you know, that adopted those values began to share them with the parents. We went into 84 and we have 84 universities where we have values champions in those 84 universities across Nigeria. We've gone beyond that. We've gone at the corporate level to be able to see how uh, the Association of Private Educators of Nigeria have endorsed the values. Mortgage Bankers Association of Nigeria has endorsed the values. And that's the kind of thing. So we've, we've pushed it into the corporate world. The Society of, for Engineers uh, in Nigeria have also adopted the values. But that's not all. Even in government, we found Anambra State Government, for instance, adopted the values. And in every school in Anambra State, they would recite the values in Igbo and in, and in English. Wow. In every government office in Anambra State, you see the 10 commitments. They're called the 10 shared values of Anambra State. One of the things that we found out was that all of a sudden, Anambra now became, in terms of, 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 of performance of, uh, you know, tertiary, into tertiary institutions, Anambra became number one. Or your state government got us in 2008 to be able to talk to 48,150 students that were preparing for NECO. And we taught them on the 10 values. Or your state normally ranks 28 in maths amongst the 36 states in performance of NECO and 23 in, sorry, 28 in maths, 23 in English. The students that we taught the values and also taught them the principles for academic excellence, 17 secrets of our high flying students, we called it. Those students, when they sat for the exam in 2009, they, they came third in English and fourth in maths out of 40, 36 states. The, 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 the Deb director general of, of NECO at that time, Professor Promise of Bala, wrote to the governor of, of Oyo State. And, and he said in that, in that thing, he said, this is the greatest transformation we've ever seen in terms of performance of any state. But the, the, the real thing he wanted to celebrate was that this or your state government also had, or the Oyo state students also had the lowest number of examination malpractice in the history of NECO. Yeah. Meaning not only did the children do very well, but they also did not cheat because they had the values. So I'm saying that I believe that, listen, if Fela can do this, I know we can do more. We have a values, a gemstone leadership network that today is able to, I mean, we teach those values. We take one value for the week and we train those values every Sunday at 7 p.m. And we have a conversation. We call it a weekly leadership summit. Hundreds of people join that summit to be able to think of how to be able to take those values and what they will do going into the next week. What I'm saying is this. Leaders don't wait for others to solve problems. Leaders do what they can. And I am challenging all the emerging leaders in the house. The values of a nation determine the value of your economy. If you, 2021, I went to the United States flying through Dallas and I, at the airport, I noticed an unmanned kiosk, unmanned kiosk, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Hawaii, right? And in Maui, the Maui in, in, in International Airport, there were unmanned kiosks. The thing is there, the payment mechanism is there, 
All you have to do is to be able to take what you want, pay for, you know, scan it, and, and then pay for it. Bottom line is, bottom line is, every nation that has the values of integrity are able to build credit and credibility. And that's what grows and accelerates growth in the, in, in the economy. Nations where people cannot be trusted must pay cash for everything and they can't grow. So values can actually translate into economic value. And for the Nigeria of our dreams to be birthed, we need leaders who will arise and role model the right values that and influence right. those values into our people. Yes. And I want to challenge you to say you, please, first and foremost, be the role model. Be the Nigerian that we want every other Nigerian to be. Be the Nigerian you want every other Nigerian to be in all the ways that you can, in the way you drive, in the way you act, in the way you arrive at work, in all you do. Yeah. And then influence and share your values with everybody. Dr. Christopher Kolade said in my closing, it's not enough for you to know what you stand for. It's important that others must know and you must be A, B, C, D for your values. You must be an advocate and an ambassador for your values. You must be a believer and a behavior for your values. You must be a crusader and a champion of your values. And you must be a defender, a dogged defender of your values. Emerging leaders, I ask of you, arise and let us together build the nation we want by being the best Nigerians we can be. And together, I know that we'll be able to build a nation of our dreams that we'll be proud to give to the next generation and they'll be grateful to inherit from us. But it starts with our values. God bless you. God honor you. And if you'd like to be able to take those values and be a part of it, it's, it's very simple. Just go to www.gemstonengnet slash creed. That's how you download an electronic version of that creed. Over 1 million people have signed up to that creed today. And I'm asking if you would, Take those creeds and then see what it is that you can do with it. God bless you. God honor you. And thank you so much, Reverend Sam, for having me. Thank you, Emerging Leadership Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Duro Toye. Can we celebrate him? Can we celebrate him? There's so much there. And time is just, you know, we, we, we are constrained by time, but there's so much because part of what he started doing really is casting that vision for us, right? The first two speakers, uh, you know, Dr. Fadel and Dr. Adeyemi were really, really emphasizing the need for us to, to, to decide who we are as a nation and communicate that. And part of what we see Mr. Dudo Toye doing is helping us to cast that vision around our values. Who are we, right? What is important to us? Values is really determining what is important. And he talked about us accepting responsibility for those values. I loved the story that he gave. Um, and I know a lot of it centered about the chastity of the woman, but I know him from afar that he cares just about the chastity of the man as he does the woman, right? I know that very much. But it was just an analogy that was given because even the nation is referred to at times uh, in, 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 the, in the female, right, to the female gender. And also another thing is being able to communicate those values and also sharing those values as a, as a, as a, as a nation. Again, emphasizing the need for unity, right? We are such a diverse 430 languages, not dialects, but such a di diversely rich culture that we need to find ways to share those values. He talked about sustaining custodians for those values and the importance of collaborating to sustain those values. These are, these are gems, really. I'm not surprised this institute is called... Um, Gemstone. And so please let's take notes. I hope we are taking notes. This is now us taking responsibility. What is my value as a Nigerian? That is another question. The first question I pose to you is what is my potential as a leader? We are all leaders. Second question now is what is my value as a Nigerian? And how am I going to be a positive change for this nation? Well, there's so much there. Again, your questions, we want to take them at the end. So we are going to move on. There's been some um, requests for us to see the slides that he showed again, but we don't have time to do that right now. 
hopefully we will do it at the end of um, our next lecture. So again, we celebrate you, Mr. Durotoye. Thank you so much for all those important um, gems that you have given to us. And our last speaker, uh, not the least, <laughs> is Dr. Alfred Tofade, and he's going to be lecturing on can Nigeria work for everyone? Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? That is a big question. And now um, let's be introduced to Dr. Alfred Tofade, and immediately afterwards, he's going to lecture us on Can Nigeria Work for Everyone? Are you still echoing the statement, we are the leaders of tomorrow, and watch things continue to go wrong in your society, workplace, church, and the nation at large? It's time to erase that mediocre mindset, because you are the leader of today. Yes, there is a leader in you. God has gifted you with awesome potentials. Don't be like many people who never step into their position of leadership due to ignorance, fear, doubt, low self-esteem, discrimination, and insecurity. Your gifts and voice are needed now than ever. That every individual step into the position of leadership in different spheres of influence is why we have compiled different courses to suit your preference at Emerging Leadership Institute. We train leaders in corporate, nonprofit, business, and government from anywhere across the world. You have access to numerous online courses in leadership, personal development, human resources development, entrepreneurship development, corporate training, and lots more. You will be learning from world-class instructors to exceed your expectations. What are you still waiting for? Unlock your potential and transform the world positively with Ellie Africa. For further details, please visit our website, www.eliafrica.org, or call 0906-4419-269. Emerging Leadership Institute, transforming the landscape of the nations through impactful and relevant leadership education. Dr. Alfred P.C. Tofade currently resides in Durham, North Carolina. One of his many passions is to help in the growth of corporate businesses in the marketplace and develop leaders across all industries, including non-profit organizations. He is the CEO of Four Seasons Legacy Investment Limited, a global organization with headquarters in the U.S. and offices in U.K. and Nigeria. He is also the president of Creative Minds Inc. based in the U.S. Tofade graduated from the University of Ife, Nigeria with a degree in pharmacy, an MBA in organizational leadership and a doctorate degree. He also took the course on executive education with specialty in governing for nonprofit excellence under Harvard Business School. He is highly skilled, effective, and a well-sought-after leadership development tutor and mentor in the USA. He is also an author and a dynamic speaker. He is currently a visiting professor to two universities in Nigeria, where he teaches executive leadership courses for senior-level executives in government and private sectors, as well as undergraduate courses in leadership. Dr. Tofade is a certified coach and speaker with John Maxwell team and has written courses and manuals for company executives, high and mid rate managers in the corporate world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Alfred B.C. Tofade. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. I am so, so delighted to join uh, these uh, beautiful uh, leaders and prominent speakers in presenting the Nigeria of our dreams. Thank you, Dr. James Fadel. Thank you, Dr. Samadeyemi. Thank you, Mr. Fela Drutoye. We are so, so blessed to actually be on this platform. I want to thank you all, those who are watching and participating from afar and near. My question today or my part is to tidy up all of this and tie them together. Can Nigeria work for everybody? 
I know that is a million dollar question that many of you are wondering, where, where is the answer there? How do we find the answer? Maybe today, many of you, you just say, well, I'm a nobody, but you are connected to someone. You have somebody in the leadership, you have someone in government, your uncle, your cousin, somebody you can actually whisper these things to. Nigeria needs to work for everyone. For Nigeria to be a country, a great nation, people need to have pride in the country. So I'm going to share a few things on my slide, if you will. Uh, please pay attention to these few things on the slide. I'm just going to make it quick and brief as to tidy up the rest of this conversation that we have uh, been engaging since morning. Nigeria of our dream. How can Nigeria work for everyone? So we go, where do we go from here? The question, the first question we have is, who does the country work for currently? And who are the beneficiaries of the country? Who are the people you can say, yeah, Nigeria is working for them. Nigeria needs to work for everyone, but who is benefiting mostly? The rich and the high and the mighty, the elite and the influential, those who have contacts and long legs, the political class, the special families, the sacred cows, the untouchable. Now, you, you know where they are. And there are over 130 million other Nigerians that live below poverty line. They struggle along. Someone says in Nigeria, there's only middle class. There's no middle class. You're either in the upper echelon or you're in the bottom pile of the port. So it is so high, it's so, so difficult. A lot of young youth are jobless jobless professionals, high brain drain in the country. What can we do to make Nigeria to work for everyone? That's the question I have in front of me to share with you in about 10 minutes. We're gonna make this quicker so that we can move on to question time. We want to build a nation that works for everyone, at least majority of the people. Do we want to be an ideal or a great nation. The question is, there's no ideal nation. There's no nation in the world that have no, uh, no challenges. The, every nation have their own challenges, their own struggles. So we're not looking for an ideal nation. We're looking for a great nation. The world is divided into two today. We call one developed nations and we call the other one underdeveloped nations or better, we call it developing nations. Why, what is the reason for the classification? Because in developing nations, things seem to work better. The rule of law is followed. The middle class is empowered. And so people are fulfilling their dreams, fulfilling their, their, their expectations. But the developing or underdeveloped nations, the rule of law doesn't work. The, the poor are trampled upon and they are yelling and crying for help. We're looking for a great nation, not necessarily an ideal nation. So in the next few minutes, I'm just going to touch on the qualities of a great nation. Mr. Drew Toy has helped us to understand where value is, what value we must have. Dr. Fadel has shown us the Nigeria of the past. What made Nigeria great? People tell story today. They, wow, we love Nigeria of those days. And many of the young people today, they don't even know what you're talking about. They never witnessed it. If you are 35 years or 40 years, you probably have never seen a, a, a nation that has worked. All the kind of leaders you have seen all your 30 years of existing is things that don't work. And of course, the, the future of the nation, of the country is in, is in jeopardy because people do what people see. If I'm 35 years old and I've never seen a nation that is working, then when I become a leader, and I'm, uh, I'm a leader in this nation, then I, I don't know how to lead. I don't know what to do. What are the qualities of a nation? Dr. Sam talks about leadership. The leadership piece is very essential. So run with me for these 10 things very quickly that will make us to be a great nation. If you're someone you have influence over, a friend, a family, you want to share this with, with them. What will make Nigeria to be a great nation? There are 10 things there. Number one is the freedom. Freedom. Any nation where there is liberty and freedom is a nation that is working. If there's no liberty, if there's no freedom, 
if this democracy does not work in that in, in the nation, then that nation is not working. Freedom in a nation is the core of what makes a nation to, to work, to be effective. Number two is justice and strong desire for equality in our society, making sure the right of everyone are protected regardless of who they are, where they live, what ex where they were born. That is what makes a nation to be strong, a nation with a strong judicial foundation which, where the rule of law works. No scapegoat, no sacred cow. That is what will make Nigeria to be a great nation where nobody's right is trampled upon. You get into the on the on the road, depending on which car you are driving, or you don't even have a car. A policeman can just stop you and molest you. And of course, nobody to come to your rescue, nobody to defend you. You don't have a personal lawyer, you don't have any access to anyone. They put you in jail, then you are dead. Nobody remembers you are there. A nation that is great is a nation where justice prevails. According to the World Justice Project, they say there are 4.4 billion people that live in a country where rule of law is declining. And I look at the statistics just to show, share some of this with you. Out of 140 countries, unfortunately, Nigeria, our country, is 118. We are on the red line. You could see that on, the, on this chart. 118, very poor score. Rule of law is a challenge our nation. This is a fact. This is not a makeup. This is a fact of the, of the case. We want to be in the blue green level where nations are respect other uh, human rights. They respect other human beings. You can count on it that the law will be on your side if you do the right thing. Now, number three, number two, you see fundamental human rights. Nigeria is 113 out of 140. Very poor score indeed. Any nation that is out of 50 and above is fundamentally flawed. That is what we're talking about. Justice needs to work for everyone. Number three, what will make a great nation? Number three is patriotism. A nation where people choose their nation above their self-interest. I'm sure many of you can relate with this. A whole lot of people, Mr. Ruto mentioned, they are rulers, they're not leaders. The moment they get into that government, they forget who they are there to serve. They serve themselves. A nation where people choose their nation above their self-interest. We're told memory lane. Many years ago, Singapore was looking out to Africa, maybe for leadership. Singapore was a poor, underdeveloped nation. And they were coming to Africa, coming to Ghana, coming to Nigeria to see what, 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 what changed, what they could borrow, what they can take back to their country. We're told the leader of that country at the time, when he related with the leaders from Ghana, leaders from Nigeria, said, mm -mm, we don't want to be like this. this. These folks, these leaders or these rulers, they are going to sell their country. They are going to, going to destroy their nation. It, cho it, it chose a different path. Today, we're told Singapore is among developed nations. Why? Because the leadership choose their nation above their self-interest. Many young people today, when you talk to them, I mean, right there, right from college, from university, they tell, you know, when I become this or become that, I am just going to take this, take that for myself. See, they already seen it. They already targeting it. That is the nation of the future. But I pray that we don't end like that. A nation that works is a nation where patriotism is a value to everyone. And what are the components of patriotism? Number one says affection towards one's country. You love your country. There are many of us here in the diaspora, but we, we, we have a, a heart for, me, for, the, for Nigeria. We love the country. We want to, 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 I mean, to, to look forward to a glorious nation where we can say, yeah, that is my nation. It is called affection. Do you love your country? Many young people, they want to exit out of the nation. They, they want to jump, jump, what do you call it now? Uh, jump out of the nation because they, they, they have no love. The love is lost. 
Patriotism, number two, interest in country's welfare. National pride, number three, national pride, identity. This is something that we need to be taught right when we were in primary school, when we were in secondary school. I remember when I was in primary school, we sing some, some national item. We, we sing some patriotic so that make you feel good you're in Nigeria. Nigeria are proud to be who they are. You go out now, these days, this age, at the airport, they look at your passport, it's a green passport, you feel ashamed because they separate you from the, from the power, from the crowd. That is a challenge. Many of us, we don't have that, that pride anymore. A nation of national pride, identity. In America here today, people say, I'm proud to be an American. One need to have that also in Nigeria. I am proud to be a Nigerian. Number four, a pat patriotic, uh, citizenry is a, is a, a kind of that sacrifice for the country when you go to war for your nation, when you are willing to lay down your life for your country. So number three, we talk about patriotism. Number four is excellence. How can we become a great nation? Where does Nigeria go from here? How can Nigeria work for everyone? We have to have excellence in our mind mindset. People work with all the art and take pride in what they do. No cutting corners, no, 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 uh, you know, people tell us today when you go to work by Friday noon or five, you don't even show up on the job. People take time off and they are on vacation on a working day. See, excellence is diminishing. If we can build excellence in our country, to our nation, we will become a great nation. Number five is morality. I'm not going to spend more time just to bring this uh, highlight and wrap it up. For all the speakers I've said today, we want a, a nation, we dream of a nation that work for everyone. We dream of a nation where immigrants from other places will come to Nigeria. We're looking forward to a time where Nigeria will become the, the art spot for, for, for people from all over the world that they want to live in Nigeria. But is that possible? Number five, morality, a clear sense of morality that resides in the heart of the people, guiding them like an inner compass as to what is right and wrong. Just like the values we were just told a few moments ago, integrity, ethics, respect, honesty. This thing begins with us and all of us need to learn to practice it. If we think about those who go to church, who go to mosque, if we practice what we are told in the church, I guess we may get rid of corruption in our country. It starts with you. It starts with every one of us. To make Nigeria a great nation, we must begin with ourselves. Do what is right, not what is easy. Looking at the next chart, they say corruption index, corruption index of our country. I took time to do this research statistically. It says Nigeria is 120 out of 140 countries in terms of corruption index. We're only better than 20 countries. That is very sad. And these are the things that we need to look at critically. I say this needs to change. The Nigeria of our dream is where we want to be in the, in, in the lower numbers, where we are, we, we can say, anytime you come to Nigeria, Nigeria takes care of you. Nigeria is a country where they respect rule of law and where they hate corruption. Number six, a merciful nation, a society, society that looks after the poor and needy without judging their status or why they are in that situation. We want to build our middle class, people. That is really the key here. We need to build our middle class. Ronald Reagan said, we can't help everyone, but everyone can help someone. We want to build that middle class where Nigeria can work for, I mean, if we flip the coin, the statistics says 130 million of people are living below poverty line. What if we flip it? What if that 130 million people become the middle class? They have a home, they own themselves. They have an automobile, they drive. They have good job. They have infrastructure working for them. Maybe that's, that's where Nigeria needs to be. Nigeria needs to be a nation that is merciful towards the weak, the poor, the needy. Number six, uh, number seven, which I'm just going to, like I said, just going over these, value of life. 
a high value of life placed on all on all life. No effort is spared to ensure that lives are preserved and extended, creating value for life. That is the Nigeria of our dream. Oh, what should it look like in Nigeria that has value? Remember recently in Sudan, the crisis in Sudan, you know, everybody ran for their life. People were fleeing the nation. In fact, United States sent a warship. Can you imagine a warship to go and rescue the Americans in Sudan? What happened to Nigerians in, Nigeria, in Sudan? They were left behind. It took a while. It took time. No organ. Every, it looks like our value for life. Our, we are come last in these things. The other time Ukrainian crisis happened also, it took a while. What is our value for life? We need to step off our people. That is a Nigeria that works for everyone. Number eight, Nigeria that works for everyone is Nigeria of creativity. We are creativity flourishes as people speak better ways to express and to serve each other. That is what we need to have in our country. Oh, I see a lot of talent in our nation, a lot of creativity. We think about it all over the world. We're told that Nigerians, in fact, I know for a fact here in the United States, Nigerians are the most creative, most prosperous immigrant in the country. Think about of our advanced layers, advanced levels. Think about significant placement and positions. Nigerians occupy them. Oh, we have lost quite a lot in our country. People have left the nations, go to other nations. What happened is we have talents, we have creativity, but we lack platforms and enabling environments. Nigeria of our dream is a Nigeria that create platform and enabling environment where we can help our young people. There are a lot of wasted youth, wasted brain, high brain drain, high unemployment. You know, think about that. The Nollywood movies is popular around the world today. You know, after uh, Hollywood and Bollywood, the next we're talking about is Nollywood. All the Africans, they, they talk about Nigeria, that, wow, Nigerians, one, one fellow reach out to me, the other, they say, wow, you Nigerian, you are so bold. You are so, you, you, you are so strong. You, there's nothing you, you, you can confront anybody. There's no job that scare you. There's no position you don't apply for. And I begin to think about that, that Nigerians, by the grace of God, we were, we were special creation of God, creative in every way. That's what Nigerians are. But what we do not have is platforms, enabling environment, structures that work for everyone. As I wrap this short presentation, we need a country, the Nigeria of our dream is where there's opportunity, where creativity is allowed and enabled. People are able to do what they are, are born to do. Creative environment, enabling environment, infrastructure. There are four things right there. Infrastructure needs to be implemented. You must say, well, what you are talking about is a lofty idea, looks impossible in the current Nigeria, but yes, even though it's far-fetched, but it can happen. I have seen it and I've seen the potential, the possibility, it is possible. If we have the enabling environment, equity, justice, and peace, if these four things combine together, they provide an enabling environment for creativity to manifest. Nigeria of our dreams is a Nigeria that works for all. Nigeria that we all can be proud of. Finally, Nigeria of our dream is a place we are stewardship. We are stewards of, of the resources, the properties, the environment, and we look after them for the generations to come. That is the Nigeria of our dream. If you have touched, if, if you have contact, anyone you know that you have influence over, these are 10 things Nigeria should look forward to, the values we must create, the agenda we must set, Maybe the government may listen to these things. Maybe some individuals out there in the place of authority may begin to pay attention to this. It is possible that Nigeria can work for all. Yes, don't be a doubter. Let's be positive. It is possible. We know what Nigeria looked like in the past. We know what it is right now, the challenge we're dealing with. 
But now we can, we are looking forward to the future. What is the future looking like for Nigeria? I have hope, I have confidence that one day we're gonna get there. You and I, we're gonna arrive just like Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. I have a dream and that dream became a reality in America. I pray today that Nigeria of our dream will become a reality and it will work for us. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Wow, wow. Let's celebrate us, Dr. Tofadi. Let's celebrate him. Thank you so much. Very, very, you know, succinct and practical, deliberate things that we can do to move forward as a nation. He gave us 10 qualities of a great nation. And one of the ones that I really hold to heart is patriotism. It was the number three quality that he talked about, because I, I think that is lacking. So many things he talked about that reiterates, you know, what we've been hearing. And again, it ties into values, values that we can hold as a nation about being merciful, the practicality of being merciful, of valuing the life of our neighbor, of the next person, of creating platforms for us to display such beautiful nation. You know, Dr. Adiyami was talking about how in all of the 36 states, you know, apart from oil, each state had two mineral resources i i did that is my it's mind blowing so we have so many opportunities and he talked about that too creating opportunities creating stewardship but creating platforms for us to really display what god has blessed us for we are really really grateful for these insights this afternoon um there's so much here and I'm so glad that this is on YouTube and we can go back again and listen and take note and share this with friends and family. Thank you so much again, Dr. Tofade. Can we celebrate him one more time and all of our speakers? Now, at this time, we have very limited time for questions. Well, there, there are a few things that have gone ahead and I'm going to start with the first question that was posed in the chat. If you have questions, please know that because of our time, we may not be able to get to all of them, but we'll try our best. And we ask that our speakers please try to be, you know, uh, straight to the point and um, as concise as possible because of our time. Now, the first question is for Dr. Fadel. And the question is, how can Nigeria go back to true federalism. How can Nigeria go back to true federalism? Uh, thank you very much, you know, for the speakers that spoke after myself, Dr. Samadi Emi, uh, my brother FD, and Dr. Alfred. Going back to federalism, I don't know whether that's a solution or not, because things has been marginalized, hearts have been displaced, states have been created. When we say federalism now, how, how do we hear from each region? Which region are we talking about? Do we have Western region anymore? Do you have the Southern region anymore? So the question is just like we have done on this platform, there has to be a collaborative effort among the leaders of each state. The Senate is there. The House of Representatives are there. We can ask them, go to your region, go and give us an idea. The question is, it has to start from each and every one of us, just like uh, Brother FD have said. We have to take personal responsibility. Federalism, I don't think that's the answer because things have uh, been dispersed, things have scattered. And to bring it back together again, just like the story, my brother FD said, you know, is it, no, no, Dr. Adi Emi, you know, of the picture of the man, that what he needs to do is the nation has scattered, trying to prepare his sermon and just give the paper to the boy. And the boy says, okay, and just look at the picture of the man, put the man together and guess what? The nation will be together. So the simple answer is let's start from the bottom. Let's start from what needs to be done. That is each and every one of us taking personal responsibility. What can I do? 
on my value system to make Nigeria great again. Thank you very much, Dr. Fadel. What can I do? Again, that's another question for us. I hope you've been writing down these questions. What can I do in my own little corner to make Nigeria a great nation? Now, the next question um, that I'm going to pose is going to be to Dr. Sam Adeyemi. And the question, sir, is how do you keep your optimism about a true leadership in Nigeria? and creating those systems you talked about, where things are really working. How do you keep opti optimism? And you know, speaking to our youth today, there's a lot of young people watching. Um, Dr. Tofari just alluded to the fact of, you know, morale being low at times because of disappointments over and over again. And how can we as individuals build optimism to keep pushing until we realize the Nigeria that we desire. If Dr. Adeyemi is not available, please any of the speakers can talk a very concise response about how do we keep our optimism. Uh, Dr. Tofade, uh, Mr. Durotoye, you're welcome to also answer. Well, thank you so much. And I, I think in a way, um, one of the things that I say when people ask me all the time, Evdi, how come you still believe? And, and one of the things that I say first and foremost is that I have a word from God concerning Nigeria. And there have been prophetic words over Nigeria. Um, one of the times when I um, I was asking God, can this nation, will, are, you, are you sure your intention for this nation will still be? God said to me, do you know any man who will invest in a place and turn his back on it? I said, well, no. He says, so if no man will do that, do you know any country that is more blessed than Nigeria? And I said, well, not that I know of. He says, so how could I bless Nigeria so much and turn my back on Nigeria? So that's one part of it. The second part is that every time I look at, you know, in a way, it's almost like a seek and you will find. When I look for bright spots across this gross darkness, I find, I find a Dr. Sam Adeyemi uh, that is that is there, and you know, Dr. Tofade and and uh, and Dr. Fadel and my sister or uh, uh, my, my my sister Shemu. And when I look at the a lot of young people and a lot of of people who are doing the right thing, I know that there's coming a time. The voices of those who are doing the right thing are becoming louder and louder and louder. People are beginning to get involved in things that they used to say was not their business. So my point is this, I am seeing a progressive recovery in the value system of Nigeria. Are things getting worse where they are bad? Yes, but things are also getting better. And once you focus on the things that are working, you will have hope. Lastly, when I see guys like this, right? And this is my son who loves Nigeria, who believes in Nigeria. I've got three boys. When I look in their eyes, I know that there is hope for this nation. When I look at the guys who have been properly raised, guys who today, if I was to ask them to raise, to say, what is the values that are driving you? Dames, can you do that in, in less than one minute, please? Um, I'm an ambassador of a generation. That is yeah, empowered. I'm an ambassador of a generation. Go ahead. That is empowered, motivated, and stirred to operate with natural excellence. This day, I hereby commit to live a lifestyle of leadership and excellence and to do all within my power to transform my country, Nigeria, into the most desirable nation to live in. And to this end, I will make a positive impact on everyone I meet and everywhere I go. I'll be a solution provider and not a part of the problem to be solved. I'll be a role model worthy of emulation. I'll be my best in all that I do, particularly the things I'm naturally good at. I will do the right thing at all times, regardless of who's doing the wrong thing. I will value time and make the best use of it. I will care and show respect to all through my words and my actions. I will consciously build a great legacy starting now, today, and every day. I'll live a life of integrity and honor, and I'll make my family, my nation, and my God proud. So help me, God. How can I not be? How? How can I not have hope? There is hope, but you have to look for it. Seek and you will find. So that's how I keep my hope alive. Thank you. That's powerful. That is powerful. Can we give a round? That is the future of Nigeria. That is the future of Nigeria. That is what we can do in our own little corner is raising 
our own children, mentoring, right? Building up leaders and generating that hope. That is so practical, right? Now, if that doesn't give you optimism, I don't know what else. Will. That, that really, really fired me up. And I hope everyone is fired up that within us, we are building courage and strengthening ourselves that this is possible. Thank you so much. One of the questions on the chat also was people asking for the um, link for um, the link for uh, the creed that uh, Mr. Drew Toye talked about. It is W, I will type it on the, on the link, but it's www.gemstoneng.net slash creed. Again, that, that will be put on the chat shortly. Um, and also the, the value systems, people wanted to, to see that. So maybe part of what we'll do is, I think if you go to that creed and you go to the gemstone, yeah, if you go to gemstone website, you will have access to, to those values as well. Um, we'll take a couple more questions because of our time. And I think this question is also for Mr. Duro Toye. Somebody wants to know how they can get one-on-one -on -one mentorship from you as an advocate of the new Nigeria. Well, it's very, very simple. It's actually to just go to www.gemstonengnet slash join. That will bring you into a, a free um, a gemstone leadership network, which is the platform with which I mentor, um, you know, emerging leaders, um, especially who are interested in all the different dimensions of, of st um, the stratas of society. Um, and so please, it's that simple. Just go to www.gemstonengnet slash join, and you will join the gemstone leadership network. That is the platform that I mentor, especially nation builders, um, who have a desire to build Nigeria into a, into a most desirable nation to live, to work, to do business, and to raise the next generation. Um, so please, www.gemstonenggy.net. Instead of creed, this time it will be join. And if you do that, it's absolutely free of charge. Okay? Wonderful. And you'll be able to connect. And three things that we do on that platform, we learn, we connect, and we access opportunities for advancement, for 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 jobs for scholarships for different kinds of things that we do so it's a it's a fantastic every way every sunday um 7 p.m on sundays we have uh, a zoom meeting um that is a weekly leadership summit we take one of the values for the week at one of those 10 we, we dissect it and then we have conversations questions we have meetings and it's just amazing what, what's going on in that space um and it's like i said it's it's absolutely free uh so it, you know Please join us if you can, it will be great. Thank you so much. Two things that I like from what you just shared is providing accessibility to everybody. You know, I think one of the things that has really created gap in Nigeria is access, right? To social capital, uh, Pastor uh, B.C. Tofade, Dr. Tofade, um, my father in the Lord was talking earlier about how you know, there's a lot of gap, right? Um, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. So we thank you for providing access to everyone and providing some kind of equity uh, to have access to those resources. Now, because of our time, what I'm going to do to wrap up is we're gonna give each of our speakers 30 seconds, right? Um, what Dr. Tofade talked about is where do we go from now? Now we've learned a lot today. There's so much. I'm reading some of the comments online and people are talking about why are more people not here? This is so rich. This is so good. Um, so how do we build on this? We've read this. It's, we don't want to sit on this. This is not something you sit on. You act on this. And so in 30 seconds, we want you to give us a quick insight of what is the next thing that Emerging Leadership Institute is doing? How can we collaborate more? How can we share these values? Very quickly, 30 seconds. I'm going to start with Dr. Tofade, then Dr. Fadel, Mr. Duro Toye, and Dr. Adeyemi will round up. 30 seconds, please, because of our time. Thank you. Thank you again. I appreciate all the comments and the speakers. Um, we need to personally take ownership of Nigeria. You know, we can't sit on our hands. That's where it is us versus them. You know, it, the, the nation belongs to all of us, whether you live in the country, you're out of the country. It doesn't matter where you live. 
You know, we were privileged to be born and raised or born and live, but you were born in Nigeria. And we need to take personal ownership. One of the things I love about what uh, Eli, Eli Group is trying to do is, look, we need to raise the next generations of leaders. When you read the Holy Scriptures, you hear about a man called Eli. Eli, you could say a lot of negativity about him. He was a failed leader. He didn't do well and all of that. But without an Eli, there will be no Samuel. See, there are Samuels that are coming in the nation, that are raised in the nation. Young people, I want to challenge all of those who complain, who are mad, who are angry about the country. What are you doing about it? See, charity begins at home, raising your own children, your circle of influence in your workplace, in your church. What are you doing in your mosque, if you go to mosque? What are you doing to bring that that influence upon the land. So I say, let each of us take ownership and contribute to what we can in our own little way. At the end of the day, it will become massive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Fadel, 30 seconds, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I want to appreciate again all the leaders here. Apostle Paul once tell his followers, follow me like I follow Christ. If there's anything you want to show anybody this, the, 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 the assignment or the work starts with me, what am I going to do different? You know, I just really love what uh, our brother Fola did, brought his son. It's not just me talking. Hear what I've taught my children in our synagogues, in our churches, in our lectures. Let us be the light, shine the light. And also, there must be a platform for training. And that's why Eli Institute is there. People do what people see. People do what people have been trained to do. Let us enroll in these classes. Let us imbibe in the lectures. It's not just reading. It's not just attending. It's not just listening. Act. Let's go back to the old system of ethics where family matters, where you do something wrong. Other people's family have corrected even before you get home. Let us be our brother's keepers. And if we do this, Nigeria will be great again. Thank you so much, Dr. Fadel. Mr. Durotoye, 30 seconds. Well, um, if you look right behind me, around there, you would see a map of Nigeria. And that map has been on my wall since 2005. It's a map that is also a mirror. Many times when people come here and say to me, FD, how do we fix Nigeria? I take them in front of the map and I say, what do you see? And they see the, I see myself. I said, well, there is no Nigeria. There's just Nigerians. And if you can be that one, the role model Nigeria, that is the typology of the Nigerian of our dream, then we'll be okay. Number two, if you can be and make a positive influence on others so that your life brings out the best in the people who try to be like you, then we are okay. And I said the third thing, if you can find a way to collaborate with other role models who are making a positive influence. And that's it. That's, it's that simple. Be a role model, be a positive impact, influencer, and then collaborate with other people who are role models and positive influencers. And that's how we we'll build a great nation. Together we can, together we must. By God's grace, together we will build the Nigeria of our dreams. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Durotoye. Okay, wrap it up in 30 seconds. It's a tall order. Um, Dr. Adeyemi, over to you. You are muted, sir. You are muted. My apologies. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sher. You've, did, you've done a fantastic job today. So <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And my, my fellow speakers, thank you so much. Um, the summary of everything, right, is it starts with me, right? Um, so at the end of the day, like we said earlier on, when you say our leaders, the average person just shifts 
the responsibility to someone, especially people that hold positions, you know, people in government. But at the end of the day, um, it's the aggregates, aggregates of all of us, all of our leadership abilities that will determine how fast the country will go. So this is the Imagine Leadership Institute, and it's a platform for training, period. And we just want to say to everyone, they say success is what happens when opportunity meets preparation. Let's prepare. Only God knows what opportunities are waiting around the corner for us. There are some where we are. There are some new ones coming ahead. So all of us should equip ourselves with leadership skills. Secondly, we should look at the younger generation. Nigeria is bottom heavy. With this massive youth population, uh, we must leverage technology. That's why this forum is holding on Zoom. There's no way we're going to catch up with brick and mortar institutions to transform the minds of Nigerians. We need to leverage technology to reach people. Everybody's a social media platform. That's our own TV network, our YouTube. That's our own newspaper now. Um, the media has been democratized. So let's leverage, let's leverage technology. Let's find the best platforms to push the message out, sell the vision of a new Nigeria, more importantly, equip people with leadership skills. With this kind of a forum, with Eli, with Gemstone Leadership Institute, and all the other institutions and platforms we're building, I have high hope that we will see the Nigeria of our dreams come to pass. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we just celebrate Dr. Samadeyemi, Mr. Felad Rutoye, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Fadel, and Dr. Tofade again? Thank you so much. Uh, you all came to us from a place of passion for this great nation, Nigeria, and it shows. And uh, we believe that Nigeria will rise and shine in Jesus' name. And so, Thank you for joining us wherever you've joined us from uh, all over the world. We encourage you share this with your friends and your family. This doesn't stop with us, but what we've become, we signed, we signed a dotted contract today that we've become contractors of change for Nigeria. And so we must be catalysts of sending this information and making sure that more people are hearing and raising optimism of what is possible for Nigeria. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Blessings to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>